Vale. Eh, good morning again. Good afternoon. Buenos dias. We are going to have this session in mixed language. So I already have here two of my panelists, uh, and uh, I would like to give some housewarming uh, information and uh, about this particular session. So. Uh, due to the nature of some context and some content provide, we would like to invite you to pay full attention to these sessions because we do not accept pictures of the slide, pictures of the um, participants because for confidentiality purpose and safeguarding one of our panelists uh, needs to be like in a confidential safe space. So for that reason, please have full attention be engaged is a very particular, is a unique opportunity. So for that reason, we're going to start. Please enjoy yourself. But what is your level of energy from one to five? So let's say that zero is I don't have energy. Five is great. Give me a visual evaluation. I have five. I have four. I have someone very honest with three. I am one of you. So like. Here we have another three here. I see that people who already has a panel uh, when the energy went down, but good to have you, everybody. Yvonne, would you like to join us on the stage for the Q&A later? Yeah, join us, it's fine. Like, it's not nice to have empty spaces. So, well, we're going to know about these ladies uh, soon enough, but uh, I would like to introduce uh, the uh, session as you can see from the title and as you can see we are going to pro to continue in two mixed language so it will be like an in and out of your headphone so the session is strengthening the coordination and mainstreaming of child protection sector so and i will try to use the slide change no yes so with me there is uh, Anna Catalina Fernandez, that she will be like the co-facilitator. She's here. Please, a round of applause is free. So, and uh, she will support us for question and interaction for the Q&A that we have time. So, we start with the next slide. Yep. So, here I have, we have here it a lot of time, working group, topics, session, working across sector, child protection minimum standard, the number one where we start, coordination, which is very important because it states like authorities, humanitarian agencies, civil society organization, and guess what? Affected population coordinate actions to protect all affected children in a timely, efficient manner. So based on that, we are going to see in this session some experience, some case studies, some work conducted in interagency, supporting the coordination to achieve what? Quality implementation in different contexts. We have here three contexts, two from the region, one from another region. We have context of Afghanistan, of Venezuela, and of Mexico. So now going back on our agenda, the second panelist, Thank you so much. Can we have a round of applause for Manami Kawamoto? <laughs> like she is like solving all the tasks that I could not. So for the next sessions, I'm going to invite and introduce, please give again another round of applause to Patricia Cornedo Garcia. She's a humanitarian professional with more than 10 years of experience in emergency disaster preparedness and response. She currently works at UNICEF Mexico as a child protection expert in humanitarian coordination in preparedness and response. What I would like to highlight about her extensive uh, curriculum is that uh, she has been like a great leadership role in the national subgroup of the protection of children in human mobility and the co-leadership of the protection sector, child protection and GBV activated for the recent response to the hurricane Otis. She also leads the line of work to strengthen the federal government's emergency and disaster preparedness. She has worked also in Ecuador with the ACNUR, UNHCR, and HIAS in the emergency protection response of the Venezuela population and on the border of Ecuador, Peru. 
In Ecuador, she has also working from the government side in comprehensive disaster risk management, having held various positions in the areas of international cooperation on top of coordination. And in this phase of government work, she was also able to lead important national preparedness processes, as well as the lead of the coordination for response to multiple event agency. Today, Patricia is here in person, ready for questions and interaction, and she will talk to us about the response of UNICEF in Mexico. Hello, and good morning, everyone. I am very happy to be here before all of you to present the work that's being carried out in Mexico. The title is very long, Strengthening Intersectoral Coordination for the Protection of Children and Adolescents in Emergencies in the Country. Maybe I think it will be important for me to start with providing data for context. Mexico is the second country with the largest number of boy, girls, and adolescents at risk to climate change. According to the Climate Change Index from UNICEF, this is due to the fact that we got 30% of children, 11% of boy, girls, and adolescents that are exposed to, to a high risk and severe due to earthquakes. That same percentage, it's at high risk to flooding and 34%, 12 and a half million of individuals or boys, girls and adolescents that are exposed to a high risk of drought. With all this, um, they also exposed to poverty, internal displacement due to violence and migration most of the population, when we're talking about children, around 19 million live in poverty. And in terms of internal displacement, the data that we have does not reflect the total numbers. But from last year, 2023, out of 400 million individuals, according to official figures, it's women, girls, boys, adolescents. And regarding the flow of uh, children on the move and that require international protection, we have seen an increase from 2019 to 2022 of 211%. This is from the state of figures. And just last year, we have 300 plus events of children that are on the move in our country. We understand that the non-official non figures must be higher than this. So within this context, when we tried to address the strengthening of the training and the response from the Mexican government, we carried an analysis with the authorities. And um, what is very common in our region is that, well, it, there are they share several common grounds, but um, Mexico has its own characteristics. We have a civil um, system and we have have a system for a for in, in comprehensive protection of children. It's a very new um, authority, but it's being supported by the government. And these two organizations work in the training and, pre and preparedness and also providing response. But we have identified that Mexico has no a sectorial um, coordination. The civil focus has no type of intersectoral type of approach in order to respond to emergencies. So this is the first barrier to work in working in the children in emergencies. So this lack of protection focus also makes us understand that there's a lack of understanding. Even though institutionality in Mexico is very strong, when we talk about the protection emergency, and as I, sp as I spoke to one of my colleagues, I think there's no clear understanding what uh, this means. Reason why there is an absence of public policies in uh, the civil protection side to protect these children, and also in the system of uh, child protection in that are exposed or are at risk of um, climate change. So this robust institutionality, it's an advantage, but it's also a challenge because it's hard to, to, uh, to create 
to make changes. And in order to create changes, it requires for us to look into the complexities of this institutionality. Another of the challenge that we have in Mexico is the federal system, three levels of government, and which the reality uh, presents a lot of disparities. Reason why the strategy is not a strategy that it's one size fits all for the northern area, the southern area, or even the center part of the country. Reason why we need to establish a process in phases to understand the characteristics and the context that we have in the country, which are very diverse. And lastly, the lack of data. Even though Mexico has been registering and they do have a very good system in the registration of information, in fact, they have a, we have a national system, we don't have a data for children. So that is another problem that we have. But it was also a great tool to or um, a leverage in order to, to continue with our advocacy and uh, to cre create that will from the, the government and the state side in order to lead uh, this whole process. The work strategy, we are based on six aspect advocacy with authorities, technical, uh, yes, the side and the government side. We were working with two institutions and other entities. The multi-sectorial approach and here it adds an additional complexity because our flag is not only a protection of the type of flagship, but we're talking about uh, public policies, um, health um, protection and um, basic needs services. So that requires to bring to the table several different authorities to touch upon many different topics, and we must focus in, uh, in a cross-sectional -se way. So this is one of the main pillars of the strategies, strengthening of the coordination and training, the evidence creation, and to be able to scale this at an institutional level. Regarding progress, this process started last year, so it's only been a little bit over a year, and we feel satisfied with the results. Why? Because when we talk about uh, children or ch in children in emergencies, considering the context in Mexico, it had a great impact. We were able to reach out to the authorities that had uh, the possibility to mobilize and to work on the topic. Regarding advocacy, we have worked at the beginning with the institutions that are guiding institutions with civil protection authority and the pre prevention or protection um, authorities. And today they are responsible of leading this process. We started at a technical level, at the directorate level, and now we're working directly with the rest of the authorities and as well with all of the different agencies in terms of education, social policies, gender is also included, security, safety, and nutrition and health. The following steps was to, to create a space, a workspace. And this was very difficult because in Mexico already has a lot of working spaces. They have commissions, they have groups, but none of the ones that I already mentioned before that could work in the coordination in order to prepare for, to have that preparedness um, in case of an emergency. We can say that today we already have a, a group that it comprises primary institutions that work in the country. This is led by the Cepina Executive Secretariat, who leads this office and works directly with CINAPRED, which is the prevention, National Prevention Center and Civil Protection Authorities. And it was interesting how all these institutions or entities, even though they have their own response protocol, in fact, education has a lot of protocols, but they do not link in any way. And there were others that when we looked into their protocols or response protocols, they had very little or they lacked information regarding um, children. 
we we had um, elections recently in Mexico. It was on, on Sunday. So we knew that we were going to face changes and uh, the directorate and the officers were going to change. So this year, what we focus on raising awareness and gaining the, that trust that we needed with um, the future governments. So this topic will continue to be a topic of it that is relevant and to for us to have a voice at the table. We have trained this staff. We have uh, trained this um, government officials that already know what is um, these, um, what is child protection in um, emergency context, and uh, they have ways to respond to emergencies. Mm -hmm. We recently had a category four hurricane of October last year, and we know that great disaster also bring great opportunities. So we took this on to, to into our advantage because everything, all of the conversations that we were we had with the authorities simply happened. So we had the opportunity simply to implement all of the, the different um, processes that we had developed, and now we're looking into ways of how to improve it. We also created several videos to address um, the need and to speak of, in a very clear language to boys, girls, and adolescents. And uh, we're also creating a web page where it addresses the needs of these children. We are currently working in understanding the standards and regulation frameworks because even though we do not have, or let's say the law, we, they does speak about child protection, but that is not translated in any protocol program or process. And there's a lot of complex, it's very complex in terms of certain institutions as to how they're able to create changes in this um, laws in order to develop later policies and programs. So we're looking into this in order to later bring proposals to create changes to the law. I also mentioned the category, um, actually five hurricane that happened last year in Mexico. Mexico or the state issues a in a report and uh, they assess or they carried out economic assessment, but they have never assessed the human impact. So this year is going to be the first year that we're going to have a report as to the human impact, specifically focusing on boys, girls, and adolescents right after this disaster, which was the category five hurricane of last year. So this will allow us to have more evidence in order to create those changes that we want to see. The next steps, the objective that we currently have is to be able to achieve the institutionalization of the boys, girls that are in state of emergency. In order to do this, we're also working in including this topic in all of the different authorities that are responsible of child protection. Right? It, the dialogue is something that it is happening and each sector has their own tools or mechanisms and within their annual plans, they do um, touch upon um, somewhat on child protection, but we don't want it to be in, in to, for this to work in silos. So we want to work uh, this uh, at a, a state level. So we've been working in um, identifying ways of how to bring this to the table and protect the, the to bring child protection. We had a commission that's responsible of developing and drafting public policies. There was uh, several voices at the table, including gender, however, not child protection. So now we are going to have the PRONAPINA that's going to focus more than ever on the child protection. We want to formalize the working group because we feel that we're, it's a bit weak. We have a government that is committed. However, we want this to be a state level topic. 
and we want to include civil society in the conversation. So we've been able to, to go step by step. I think that the best strategy was to work at a federal level. And once that we have the process in a more consolidated way, we'll be able to, to access or reach out to key stakeholders. Regarding training, we're going to repeat what we did last year, because uh, please be reminded that we just went through any elections. So we need to, to retrain these new officials. And we uh, have already started training the civil society at a state level and hopefully in the next the next wave of training will be in intersectoral training we're also working with the mexican red cross which is another non-state responder we're looking into reviewing uh, their protocols and also to train them in child protection because they are our, our second largest responders after the government however they don't have any topics related to child protection in emergency context. In this training, we would also like to include uh, uh, the topics related to education. Mexico does have a schools of civil protection. They're very robust. And this year, they created the network of civil society, civil protection authorities. So we wanted to work at a um, tertiary education and even a high school education or secondary education for these children to understand that this is an area of work or a possibility to work. Now, regarding scalability, it all depends on after we run our diagnosis. And then after we run our diagnosis, we'll be able to design and pilot at a state level and be able to outreach those 32 states that we have in Mexico, prioritizing on those, um, those states where there are higher levels of poverty. But the objective is for this to be a state level policy. Based on our experience, we can only say that there are there has been a lot of work around child protection in Mexico. It's complex, yes, but I think what we currently have is more robust than what we had many years ago. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias. And I love the spontaneous applause. So like take it as a direct feedback. So uh, thank you so much for your attention and for the wonderful presentation on Mexico. Uh, I'm going now to introduce the last panelists for the day and uh, uh, after we will proceed with some Q&A, but please help me to welcome Gina Hisedre. Uh, she has more than 12 years of experience in the field of child protection and education. So in the last five years, Gina, he has held roles, including child protection officer at UNICEF Venezuela and coordinator of the child protection area of responsibility at the subnational level in the same country. Her experience has included working in border areas with Brazil, Trinidad and Tobago and Colombia, as well as in multicultural and multilingual indigenous contexts in Venezuela's Amazon states, Amazonas and Bolivar, and in the Odinoco Delta. Ginahi has provided technical assistance in Venezuela and in the Dominican Republic at the border with Haiti and in areas that include child protection in emergencies, gender-based violence, children's rights approach and other cross-cutting areas. She is currently the national coordinator of the child protection area of responsibility in Venezuela and this is like the new example of interagency coordination that we are going to explore together. So please, an applause to Gina. I just want to say thank you for the invitation. Thank you for having me here, this opportunity to share in the experience in Venezuela. We do speak a lot about, about Venezuela and the humanitarian response for Venezuelan, but it is also important to understand what is happening within Venezuela. So this is a beautiful experience to share. What I am going to share today is just a snapshot, just a little bit of what has been 
a process of working with other sectors, with other areas within the humanitarian response in Venezuela in order to, to promote that uh, children and adolescents be the sector of the humanitarian response. In order to provide some background, in Venezuela, the humanitarian response was established in 2019. In other words, it's a response that's pretty new to Venezuela. Historically, Venezuela was not a country in which we needed to respond to this type of situation because we didn't, we haven't had any type of this crisis in the past. I say this because this means that we had to learn a lot in order to establish a humanitarian architecture in a very complex environment at a political in a political sense in which initially we weren't able to even to speak about the word or use the word humanitarian in fact we couldn't even, well, yes exactly we could not use it this has changed somewhat but it meant that we needed to establish coordination, structures, sectors, clusters, areas of opportunities, and mechanisms in order to coordinate all of the different spaces, intersectorial spaces. It required us to develop a structure, a humanitarian structure at a country level. I say all this because the integration and in and, and the integration into the inclusion of child protection was also part of a this learning curve in Venezuela. In, we must consider that in the past, this was something that we didn't have in the country. In fact, there wasn't a lot of knowledge within the organizations about this, this, this topic. Now, we currently have eight clusters and two areas of opportunity, one uh, that focuses on gender-based violence and the other one it focuses on uh, child and adolescent protection. Now, this is important because the humanitarian response in Venezuela currently prioritizes or it has identified that 1.3 million of boys, girls, and adolescents within Venezuela face needs of protection. But the general response that they receive from all the different sectors only covers 7 million of Venezuelans within the country and 40% of them are boys, girls, and adolescents. So that means that it's not just child protection that is working with boys, girls, and adolescents, but all of the other areas are also working on this. So in this construction process or building process and uh, collective understanding, we have uh, several experiences. One, the strengthening of the organization in this integration process and mainstreaming child protection. But we were also able to identify the need of having a more structured processes in order to achieve more efficient results in this manner. As we had spoken in previous um, sessions, and in fact, it was mentioned on Tuesday and yesterday that when we work with other sectors, number one, it is very important to understand that we are all, we all hold some certain level of co-responsibility in child protection and not only child protection authorities. On the other side, We needed uh, for organizations to take on the responsibility in the identification and the referral of cases. And we identified that that was a challenge, a very significant challenge for the organizations or entities. So we started to drafting all of the different um, areas of opportunities from the field. In fact, we also have subnational reports that we received for the, with situations as to what was happening, cases of child protection that were not being addressed or not addressed or were not addressed in a safe manner. And it was through the feedback mechanisms that we have at a national level, which is an interagency hotline, which was, was part of the structure to, in order to in order to 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 report or to have certain level of accountability of all what was 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 being performed 
and carried out in each one of the structures, we identified that it was important, it was very important for us to work in a better coordination. So these are the things that we were able to achieve. Remember that this is only a snapshot. We started with the identification of all of the needs that I already mentioned, but once we established the dialogue with all of the different clusters and we agreed that in fact this was a need for all of us, that is when we moved on to establish this as a priority of our HRP in order to provide child protection. So this was a priority in our working plan in our area of responsibility of protecting boy, girls, and adolescents. Then we moved into establishing methodologies with all of the clusters in order for us to carry it out or to provide continuity in the strengthening of capabilities. We held in-person training and meetings with all the clusters for them to understand areas of, of responsibilities. Sessions were for one, uh, one, year, one day and a half, and we were able to work directly with the cluster, identifying their areas of opportunities. We worked directly uh, with the identification of a team that will be responsible of the oversight of the responsibilities in terms of child protection. We not only worked with the clusters, but we also were able to share in, in tools and train them. Some of the topics that were ident that were included was the identification and the safe referral of cases, because as, as I said before, this was a priority. We also included other recommendations in the integration of boy, girls, and adolescents in each one of the sectors aligned with the recommendation that came out from block four that are the minimum child protection norms. Previous to, to this step, it is important for me to highlight the area of responsibility along with its members. They have already built a format for the, re to, for the referral of uh, these children and a guideline for the safe referral of cases. To have a document and to share it via email is not enough. It needs to go through all these processes. As part of the process, many of the results that we achieved was the 55 organizations at a national and international level that were part of the response and from the different sectors engaged and were part of the training process. A total of 122 individuals were trained. But what's mostly important here is the, the outcome of the training process is that we establish agreements between the areas of responsibilities with all of the clusters. And these agreements established uh, this different, different things as to after this, what's going to be our areas of our responsibilities as the wash cluster, as the protection cluster, in order for this uh, to have um, some impact and you know, as we roll this out to the, the field. After this, because of the training and because of these processes were happening at a national level and in person, there was a need in, to expand or to bring in more people to work on the field. That is why we prepared webinars that were there at the disposal of everyone at all times with this very short videos that are no longer than two hours, we are able to train other volunteers. All of these webinars actually were shared with all of the authorities and agencies that were working and are working with child protection. This was uploaded to a website and this is currently shared specifically to that uh, those agencies who have a role or area of responsibility in terms of child protection. Another thing that I would like to share that in fact I was speaking uh, to the to another colleague about it is that we need to go back to the foundation. 
Let's go back to basics. We needed to talk about the, uh, the, the focus on children's rights and how emergencies have an impact in boys, girls, and adolescents. The international and national regulatory framework in regards to boys, girls, and adolescents. And as I mentioned before, the safe identification and referral of cases. Now, reflections that I can share regarding this collective work period. Number one, now I'm not want this to sound like a cliche. I know this is something that has been around since, since since Tuesday, but I have to say it is part of the reflection process. It's not it's just to help convince ourselves. It's just that it is understood and uh, by other sectors and areas that working with other clusters is key in order to ensure the protection of boys, girls, and adolescents. And that this is a constant process. It's not just a series of trainings and that's it, but we have to come together to build tools together to hold that dialogues and also to teach with love. Because another element that we identify is that other sectors were fearful in asking questions to the protection or child protection area because they presumed that they that the child protection sector was going to think that they were doing something bad but it's 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 not good to to judge it's a matter of building together these um trust and confidence building it allows us to learn and do think better but it's also important to foster the leadership of specialized national organization in the process of strengthening their capacities and working in strengthening the capacities of other sectors, because this that helps them not only with developing and expanding their capabilities or capacities, but it also helps in working with other sectors because we understand that once the humanitarian response and hopefully we we will reach that the day when this is no longer in the country it is the national authorities and sectors who are going to be responsible of this and lastly reaching agreements with sectors is a strategy to follow up on strengthening the process and to put lessons learned in the practice is it's it's very important to assess the knowledge that we have at the beginning and the knowledge that we have at the end. And it must be monitored. Whatever is thing that is not working, it must be reassessed. We must retest in order for us to achieve our goals. In the end, it's just a process of collective building that needs to be continuous. And with that, I just want to say thank you. Thank you for allowing me to share a little bit of the work that has been carried out in Venezuela. I remain at your disposal should you have any questions, comments, or feedback. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nina. Well, here we are. Uh, I hope that you feel inspired like me. I was really thinking uh, if I wasn't a facilitator, I wouldn't be a participant of this session. So much inspiration. Thank you. And can I ask an extra round of applause because representation matters and we have three strong women here on the panel. So saying that, um, I'm going to improvise a bit, but like I would like to open the floor for the next part with questions. So we have seen examples of coordination with local authorities, coordination with uh, community leaders in ensuring participation in Afghanistan of women. We have seen like great example of coordination cooperation at between humanitarian actors, agencies, governmental bodies, and authorities in Mexico. And we have seen like a great example of working across sectors. So I'm like, probably we could bring this as a case studies for the um, interagency activity on uh, the CP area of responsibility in Venezuela. Do we have any questions in the room? 
I have a question in regards to the presentation from UNICEF Mexico. I thought it was quite interesting when you spoke about that when there's situations of disaster, they will do a report of economical impact and that you were giving a proposal of human impact report. But I would like to know more about the criteria that are gonna be used to work on this report. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I'm I'm so sad to have come in a bit uh, late uh, because this is such a fascinating um, and very inspiring presentation. Is that a question on Venezuela? I'm immediately thinking to myself, like this this sounds excellent. I want I would love to see that you know replicated in other regions or other countries. But my immediate fear is like the lack of resources. And for example, in the Southern Africa region, like. We are we are stretched beyond belief in terms of just the staff capacity to like coordinate something like this. So I was wondering um, if you could if you could shed some light on how did you start this? Like what was the first step? If I was going to go and, and speak to my colleagues in Southern Africa and say this is what I want to do, what's the first step? How do we commence that process? Because I think it's huge work, but huge impact as well. Thank you. Thank you for your presentations. I wanted to go more in depth in regards to the experience of Venezuela with the discussion that we, you said that there were some agreements in regards to the training. This was very interesting. I wanted to know if in those discussions, um, if they spoke about the delays of the interventions of other sectors can have the impact on the child protection and how there has been a collective reflection on the vision of how they implement their activities and the problems and challenges that they confront and which is the impact that they have in child protection because there are many examples in this sense and I would like to know if this was agreed upon and how it works operationally. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Yes, Mexico many years has been raising the economical report of impact of emergencies annually. And this has been an initiative that's coming from CEPAL, ICLAC, and there's going to be a human impact report the first time this year for assessing the impact of disaster of the UN program. And this is going to come to complement PDNA. And this has four indicators, education, health, means of life, means of living. And I think the fourth one, my memory, I can't remember which one it is but it's the most basic needs. But these four indicators, do we have child protection? We're gonna add one more, child protection. If we wanna have a special chapter of child protection, um, this could be a proposal when the hurricane occurred in Guerrero, in Acapulco, which is one of the most violent one in Mexico, and we're working, we want to add to the official methodology, this five, fifth indicator of child protection that we can have information in regards to this, and we're so enthusiastic in regards to this. Thank you for your two questions. In regards to the first one, well, there was not a process really because first of all we started to receive information that helped us to identify that this was a need it was not a linear process we saw this from different angles as i explained from the beginning since it was a humanitarian response as something new we had to do a lot of training what was this of the clusters the areas of responsibilities which were their responsibility which were their roles and starting from there maybe many of you are aware of this assessment that is done in prolonged crisis once a year in regards to the performance of coordination. 
So what the roles meant and the responsibilities that were in the coordination, it helped the organizations to identify, are we really complying? And it motivated that there could be internal reflection in the response. But in parallel, we were also receiving information from the field on terrain from the different states in the country, the different areas in the country, and they were stating, we're seeing this type of situation, it's not good, we need to do something. And this was sent to all the organization in the areas of responsibility. So I think this was key that we could start that initiation to do that step to the intercluster group. It was to say that to ensure that this was something that was happening, there was the space of the intercluster, it was appropriate to do this. So I really think that it was a coincidence of many elements that took us towards this. I must say clearly, Venezuela already was quite strengthened, strengthened because there was a civil society not structured to respond to a situation, a humanitarian situation, but very well prepared in regards to specialization or protection of children and adolescents. So there was already a capacity that was already pre-established that allowed in the process of reflection that we could say, this is where we need to start. We need to start with this. In regards to the next question, in regards to the agreements and how this was made operational, the space of a dialogue was done bilateral with each one of the clusters. It's not that we brought all of them together in one place and said, we're gonna talk about this. It was tailored for each one of the clusters and also the agreements. So what we were seeking was to respond to the particular needs that the same organizations from the cluster and that were identified. And this could give you a concrete example, like in the area of nutrition, the cluster of nutrition. Quickly, they recognize this need because the cases that they were receiving of boys and girls that had needs, nutritional needs, it resulted that it was boys and girls whom their parents had migrated. And for this reason, they were not accessing for breastfeeding. There was such a complexity that was also associated with topics of protection. And they said, we want to improve this and coordinate better for the referral of these cases. In this sense, the cluster of nutrition in collaboration of the area of responsibility. They establish a tool that they call it the checklist to make sure that key responsibilities were incorporated on the main focus of gender because they had already started that process of gender equality network. And they said that the key actions should also be part of this, that we can make sure that we're included the action of protection for boys, girls, and adolescents. So this was quite concrete to make it operational. Thank you so much. Can I jump on the participant group because i have some questions as well so like <laughs> and guess where i'm going <laughs> like, so um from my side first of all gracias for uh, su contesta uh, i have some questions uh, taking like advantage of what was the sessions of yesterday doing more with less so and probably like uh, using your expertise Yvonne on uh, global <laughs> understanding so uh, I would like to ask you like uh, the as we know that humanitarian funding space is shrinking uh, while we uh, observe that worldwide crisis are still increasing there is like multiple necessities and so on so um, are there are any good practice that you as IRC or IRC Afghanistan has employed to address such challenge? I must say that I'm representing my colleague who could not be here. And so it's not my global expertise, but really the expertise of the teams that we have in uh, the context where we work with all the different access challenges. And uh, so 
I hope that I represent the team well. So the difficulty that we have in Afghanistan, I think is also similar to some contexts where access is, uh, the political situation then makes access really impossible to do protection work. And I'll reiterate what my colleague had presented in his uh, presentation in the recording, that um, I think many times when the resources are limited and also the access space is limited, protection or child protection uh, actors or practitioners really feel that pressure to do something because you're seeing the needs, but then you don't have the space or you don't have the budget or you don't have access and it's really frustrating. So reflecting again on how the teams in Afghanistan were seeing the health colleagues really moving on forward with their work. And uh, I think health had uh, permission to engage female uh, workers while protection could not. So an opportunity there, working across sectors, embedding protection work within the health teams and seeing that as an entry point to deliver protection programming. Um, Shrinking resources means that operationally, maybe not the best practice, but operationally we're able to use health in terms of their vehicles, their, you know, all the small things that we can limit in our budget to be able to access services uh, and deliver protection services. The other thing that uh, takes time and it's also very frustrating when needs are really high and on your face, but you have to do something is having that understanding that things, things take time. So um, building that community engagement, trust, which again, my colleague had explained in his presentation, the buy-in so that the community members themselves are helping us to advocate to the local authorities why we must, why you must continue to deliver services. So having the community members themselves as our allies to be able to deliver services and building that strong relationship with our local authorities, uh, sorry, with our local uh, partners to, of course, um, access local authorities. Um, again, something that RC has done and uh, probably it's best practice also in other, across other organizations is that we have a percentage, it's a target now, that a percentage of our budget must go to local partners. And it's a target that each country program must, must reach. And then within that percentage, a certain percentage again, I'm, I'm trying not to quote the percentage because I'm confusing between 40, is it 40, was it 30? Anyway, uh, has to go to women-led organizations. So because it's an organizational commitment and it's a target, the money has to go to the local uh, partners. So that also really gives us the push to work with local organizations and to deliver services. And again, we know from what we've had yesterday and uh, the last two days that uh, they're present and they're able to access uh, the communities better than we are. Just finally on one thing is that uh, in many country programs when we're working on behavior change and violence reduction in the home, we see that we have a higher number of women participating in the programs when it's behavior change and really low male engagement, especially for violence within the home. And so one of the things that we saw as a success again in Afghanistan was that we had a very high male engagement, which again, really targeting, um, we cannot change behavior by only looking at one, one group of the population. So really working with the, the male um, parents, male caregivers in the program and having a high number of male staff gave us access and so an opportunity to still influence our behavior change and violence re reduction outcomes in the home. So I hope I do justice to my colleagues and, uh, and I hope I answered your question. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, uh, time is running out. Uh, may I still like uh, uh, use the advantage of having the microphone for a question for like Patricia. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> So um, I'm going to try to speak to you in Spanish. I would like to know in regards to the context of the work of UNICEF, how are you going to work for the protection? Child protection will be an effective part, an effective part of the policies of the rest of the sectors when we talk about integration. Thank you. Well, well, here may be two strategic lines. The first one already referred to it. And we have looked to in sector, which are the tools that are part of the public institutional, institutionality. 
the prevention by the Cent National Center of Prevention of Disaster is the one that does the assessment and monitoring of the risk and of the threats. And it's the one that drives public policy. Mexico currently is just working on the risk management of disasters. This committee is part of the spaces in which all the government meets to refer to strategies. And the positive thing is the National Center, Senapet, which does not suffer because of the political changes, there's a deputy director that has been there for 25 years, fully aligned. And we're going to work on the focus of the child care and prevention and care in emergencies preparation and response. We have the National System Coordination of Civil Protection. And here, the two studies that were mentioned previously, the one of diagnosis, how are we in regards to the legal framework and human impact is not going to give us a lot of data on children. So this is going to be another great argument that we can work on this. So at the level these two great systems of prevention and preparation with the system of protection, childhood protection. I mentioned that we had Pronapina, something unique in Mexico. No other system has a work plan that's institutionalized with indicators and in all in public institutions. Pronapina works for the integral protection of childhood and it has a weak line for emergencies on topics related to education, because when we talk about children in emergency, they focus 100% on education, and there's an absence of child protection in the public policies. So this is our third work area for child protection to make it more robust. And there we touch each one of the sectors, not only protection. We have 10 minutes before the end of the session, so, uh, do you have any other questions coming from the room? The work that is done from Venezuela, it's a work that is developed only because of initiative or from funds from the government. Or is there an articulation with international organizations? Mm -hmm. Thank you for your question. It's a really good question. In the case of the, hu the humanitarian response, it's the finance of the donor countries, not because of the financing for the, gov in the government in particular, not from the government of Ver Venezuela. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, again, a question on Venezuela experience in the discussion among cluster, because it's very interesting. I, I was in Venezuela a couple of months ago and I was part of one of those discussions about the performance of cluster. And uh, to me, it would be very important to understand and unpack more how we can measure then how effective is this inter-cluster discussion and collaboration. Because uh, it, it has to be proved, it has to be, um, to be substantiated with evidence that uh, this conversation are uh, taking us forward in uh, advancing in putting children at the center of our responses. It has been very encouraging, the discussion that I heard, and it's probably very early probably to, to assess now how we measure the, the, the impact of this intercluster collaboration. But I wonder if you can share some of the uh, perspective in the future for doing this kind of measurement, if that is possible. Thank you for your question. In fact, it has been part of the discussion in all of this process, more so in the area of responsibility of child protection. Well, yes, we have these tools, we have provided them, we are collaborating, but how do we measure? How more so than how we measure? Because, but more, how do we know? How do we make sure that it's used effectively and that it's responding to the needs? for which it was created. So we could say that this is the next steps of the area of responsibility, but with some sectors we have already began, we have more concrete steps with education precisely. 
with the sector of education, HRP, the most recent one, has included in its logical framework a specific activity of cases of protection to the protection program, health protection, and there's an indicator for that as well. So based upon this, and this is based on referral program, so we're starting to measure this already. The vision is indicators that it will be aligned in the HRP, but also to cover the qualitative part that through the reports on terrain and case studies to know how this is being developed at a more qualitative manner on terrain that becomes a substance more so than just the numbers. I have like the role of uh, closing this uh, session at the stage. So like lunch is coming and uh, I'm pretty sure that conversation can continue. Please uh, be ensured that uh, if you liked this session, tell it to everyone so that they can come to approach the panelists ask question. If you didn't like, let it be. <laughs> okay, so keep it for us. But yes, I would still encourage the conversation to go because as you saw, there is uh, some initiatives on working across sector. There is still like case studies that uh, this is the value of the annual meeting, is a meeting, is an encuentro in order to learn from different contexts, from different experiences and try alternative solutions somehow. So for that reason, please don't keep uh, the conversation here otherwise it will not be useful let's generate creative new forms of engagement and solution to work together please join me in a round of applause for the panelists has been an incredibly privilege so extremely in uh, extremely inspiring and please as you could realize i'm terrible with the technology and support i couldn't make this session go on time without the support of Manami Kawamoto and Anna Catalina Fernandez. Thank you so much, enjoy your lunch.